So uh, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, any views, opinion expressed, uh, not that of the Coca-Cola company. So just get that out of the way. I think to have a discussion on this is very important to have a definitional conversation. What exactly is packaging? We touched on this earlier. And I think it's actually a little bit uh, not so straightforward. Uh, I will begin by just contrasting food contact substance versus food contact materials. Uh, I think every talk in, will always have to touch on 409H6, the definition for food contact substance. And I'm not a lawyer, but I thoroughly enjoy this passage. <laughs> I think it's something good to have a group study, just uh, you know, analyzing the, the wisdom that's been imparted into this language, because you look at this. You know, any substance that's intended for use as a component of materials used in manufacturing, packaging, packing, packaging, transporting, holding food, if such use of substance is not intended to have any technical effect in the food, now, I also put in bracket as consumed. I think, let me just pause here. I think, you know, if, if the last word food is not understood as consumed, then you become having a circular argument. Then what is this food different than the previous food in the third line? But I think the different people that I talked to, and I think we have many people from the FDA here can correct me whether it's generally understand the last word food is food as consumed. My understanding is yes, it is. So I think what's the beauty of this is that the statutory definition, among other things, provides the concepts of intended use, which is very important. The requirements of inertness, the word not have any technical effect. The connection to food is consumed. There's a very important thing to be said there. And what I think is often overlooked is a hierarchy of supply chain. We talk about supply chain in earlier talks. Greg Pache from Sun Chemical talked about supply chain. The supply chain is actually baked in to the statutory language. You talk about substance use in materials used in packaging. Now, why do I think this is important? I thought, let's just compare, contrast what the Europeans says. They have a definition called food contact materials. And really, it's not a definition at all. It's an enumerated list of things that are food contact materials. It's actually given in article Annex 1 of Regulation 1935-2004, and most of the time is shorthanded as the Framework Regulation. Now, there are 17 of those. Now, I, for one, use chopsticks quite a bit in eating, and most of the time, chopstick is made of bamboo. I don't see bamboo there, so does that mean the Europeans don't use bamboo? How is that going to be regulated? Do I see grass? You know, G-R-A-S-S. -S. No. You, you see, the, 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 the bifurcation of the regulation begin at the very outset. And so let me just say that, you know, having, regardless of whether we use food contact substance or food contact material, the fact that the, the distinction exists is something we need to hang on to because a lot of time the difficulty begins when people do not distinguish substance from materials to articles because when people don't make that distinction, people cannot communicate. That this whole thing break down because you say, oh, this is proprietary. Well, it's proprietary to the extent you have formulary complexity. But if you are selling something that's based on a standard, 
as in the case of pure substance, that you have more application to disclosure. On the other hand, if I'm making an article, I am already taking care of how to make it inert. And I should focus on disclo disclosure and communication on how inert it is because I cannot say I don't know the use. I know the use very well because I don't, it's very peculiar, uh, specifically made to your specification. The last thing is about food as consumed is that the two supply chain are different. And I think the problem a lot is not only that people don't distinguish the different linkage in the supply chain, which is amply supported by the statutory definition, but also that it's a distinct supply chain from that of food, of the edible food. When you try to have a conversation and try to obliterate all this distinction, then yes, we will have a lot of misunderstanding, miscommunication, and then the public is not well served. Having said that, just on the word packaging, let's move on to risk. For the purpose of this, I, I'm gonna use a substance which I think, well, full contact substance, or a particular material that's, you know, I say have no, uh, I'm not, I'm just using this as an example for the purpose of illustration. This particular material called SPAT, or simply called as SPG modified terephthalate. It's a polyester that was introduced by Mitsubishi Gas Chemical and uh, uses a special glycol called spiroglycol, which is shown at the lower left, okay? So if you don't use the, the uh, spiroglycol uh, as a co-monomer, if you just polarize terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol, you get the bottle grade PET. I kind of generalize a little bit, simplify somewhat. There's ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol that full of purpose. Just say terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol is what we use to get the polyester bottles. If you can modify that to give it more heat resistance to bring the glass transition temperature above water, boiling temperature, you, so that you can put it in a dishwasher, okay, you probably want to use it. In the case of the FDA, FDA did risk management and risk assessment and was, after 120 day, issued the FCN 1135. All the people that are downstream benefit from the use of it. Now let's look at Europe. It was submitted by FSA of the UK. Uh, Interestingly, now that uh, with Brex, you know, what's going to happen? But now we know that uh, it was given a risk assessment on October 2014, then went to the commission. So this is about two years later, you know. And then, just uh, a little bit over a month ago, the regulation was published. Okay. This is the kind of timeline that industry has to deal with. So if you have something that was introduced in 2010, you have something in 2012 from the FDA, you have 2014 from EFSA, but that really does not get you anything with a legal standing until 2016, which was just a, you know, a couple months ago. So why is this relevant? I thought let's talk about migrating for a little bit. FDA lists the material as a polymer that consists of the three monomers, okay? So, so terephthalic acid polymer with diethylene, uh, ethylene glycol, and that lone name is the SPG. And the intended use is there. If you make it less than five millimeter, you're okay. If you use it based on this 
stoichiometry, you can use conditions that use C through G or B through H. That's the parameter that are given. However, the opinion that was issued, it now <clears throat> has this, let's focus on the, the bottom part, the migration, the substance itself does not exceed five ppm, and the migrations of oligomers does not exceed 50 ppb. Now this is interesting. Uh, many people in the consulting industry begin to, to wax poetry about uh, EFSA begin regulating uh, oligomers and oligomers nias and so on and so forth. So by the time it gets to the regulation that was published, uh, it not only talk about 50 ppb, but now it says if you're really gonna do this, you need to have a well-described method, you need to have a competent authority that can verify the compliance and adequate sample, you need calibration. Now that's just think for those that, you know, with some chemistry training, how exactly are you gonna do this if the sample is not commercial, okay? And if you're gonna do this, how are you gonna collect enough oligomer fractions to do the calibration, to do the identification, to purify enough? This is quite a tremendous challenge as opposed to just say that I measure the thickness to be five millimeter, okay? Now, just to recap what, from industry perspective, if I am a manufacturer interested in this, I will have this company in Japan introduce this to the market. In April 2012, it has an effective FCN. After that, you can rely on the effective FCN to market. Prior to that, really, you still had the options of doing grass through scientific procedures and do that, okay? I don't think people will be foolish enough to do that, but it's not really illegal, but you have, you, know, you, you have the FCN route that you do want to rely on. On the, on the European side, then what we see here is an interesting situation where prior to EFSA opinion, it is unsafe or unevaluated after the EFSA opinion issue is safe, but it's not, but it's illegal. And finally, until August of this year, it becomes safe and legal. So, that brings us to the observations and conclusion portion. I will say that both the US and EU had determined the same polymer which doesn't know whether it's physically, this lump of plastics is in Europe or in the US or Canada. Both have laid down parameters and both have pronounced it to be safe. But the thing is the parameters that are laid down to describe safety are very distinct, distinct one from the other. And I think the incongruence of these two parameters creates problem because most of the time people will say this is okay in US and not in EU or vice versa. And this compliance gap invariably will be interpreted as a safety gap. I think we, you know, I, I put this, you know, I, just for the sake of argument, the circle and the square have the same area, enough to protect the the mouse, or should I say Charles River Rat. <laughs> no, let's just look at it differently. Which one are you better protected from this Charles River Rat, whether it's by cir concentric circles or a bunch of squares? Or are you troubled by the fact that just a little bit of, you know, in and out is making you unsafe? I think that's the kind of things that the public is grappled with.
because there, it's not easy to comprehend this kind of distinction. Unfortunately, it's not just two. I'm glad to see uh, Anastasia here from Health Canada. We actually have more three different systems, just like as you know, we have three different kind of geometry, geometry framework. You can use rectangular, you can use cylindrical, you can use spherical. Whichever shape you use has its natural ways to describe, but one works better than the other two. But what happened is that we are confined to one particular kind of framework that makes it very awkward to describe safety, as in the case that I just used, you know, SPG I used to illustrate. So how can we overcome that? That's kind of going to be my last slide. How, what can we do? You know, I suppose it's probably, if there's anything we can kind of overcome this kind of miscommunication and misunderstanding, perhaps we need some kind of language that transcends. Because, you know, unlike the full additives, you can talk about full category, functional class, ADI, and so on. You know, yes, we can talk about all the difference between WHO, JACFAS, and you know, all that. But by and large, the framework are the same. You can, just like you can convert kilometer per hour to miles per hour to meter per second. It's possible to make some kind of conversion and still be very precise. The problem is, if I were to tell you, you cannot, your vehicle wheel cannot revolve more than 40 revolution per second and you will not have odometer, and you try to comply with a speed limit, how are you gonna do that? Invariably, you will have gaps. So, last thing, this is my final slide. I know I'm out of time, but what I think may be helpful is this. Consider, <laughs> this is, you know, oversimplified toxicology, and I'm not a toxicologist. If we take Noel, and we know that we back a hundredfold or more, we get to ADI. Or in Europe, they call it TDI because it's regarded as contaminant. Now, we know that we talk about threshold regulation. If you are one hundredth of ADI, you, have a, you can do threshold regulation. Most of the substance that of interest to what's called NIAS, such as printing inks, such as adhesive components, they are so highly formulated, such small contribution, they are way, way beyond on the far left-hand side. So safe, you have such huge margin of safety, that's not really recognized or much talk about. And I think as long as we do not drive a distinction between food ingredients and food contact and do not talk about the safety that's inherent in there, I think we will have a lot of difficulty convincing the public that we are doing a good job uh, protecting public health. So with that, I will close. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll take questions.